Thank you very much. Um, thank you also, Mario, for the opportunity. And um, yeah, unfortunately, um, my colleague is sick and I uh, just jump in for her, for her. So yeah, just for a short introduction, I'm the head of investor relations at K plus S. I'm with the company since 17 years in various functions, investor relations, corporate secretary. Um, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to present K plus S to you. Now I, yes, it works. Um, this is the short disclaimer. You know that just for those of you who don't know us, um, who is K plus S and who is it um, delivering to? This is who is K plus S and what are we doing? Basically, we are a mining company and a salt mining company because potash is a component of crude salt. Um, that means mining salt or potash as a component of crude salt. Um, it doesn't really matter, but it, these are separate mines. So we are mining potash in um, Germany and in Canada. We are the only potash producer with um, operations on two continents. And we have salt mines in Europe. Who are these or in, in which industries are these products going? This is for potash, first of all, and the most important part, agriculture. So it is used as a fertilizer on fields. Um, and potash also goes into industry applications, for example, um, pharmaceutical salts, electrolysis, um, oil and gas drilling. Um, these are interesting industries where we are also delivering potash products too. And salt products go into very, very um, yeah, different industries. 5,000 different end usages. Also here you have electrolysis, you have dyeing, you have the whole food industry. Um, you have for sure also the consumer who is using salt and you have the icing salt. So this as a very brief introductions on the field of our usage. And connected to this immediately, what are the mega trends? And you will find the mega trends, um, especially on the agriculture side, but also partly on the industry plus side. And I will come to them now. So we have a global population increase. And as long as we have this global population increase, there are more people that want to eat. On the other hand, we have less arable land per capita, um, but also in total less arable land available because of uh, bigger cities, because of bigger need um, to live. And that's why the intensity of the agriculture has to increase. That's why the every part of land who is growing food um, has to be better treated in a way that it uh, brings more um, food per, per hectare. And fertilizers are one part um, to do that. And we will um, shortly come to the um, different roles of fertilizers in that game. This is a very old law. It's called the Liebig law. It's nothing new. It's not rocket science, but it is very important for agriculture also today. So what is this little picture telling us here? The Plant needs three nutrients, three main nutrients. This is potash, phosphate, and nitrogen. You see more other trace elements that the plant also help, but the most important ones and the main ones are potash, um, nitrogen, and phosphate. And the thing is that you always need for a certain plant a different combination of these three, but you will never be able to replace one by the other. They all have different roles in the nutrition of the plant. That means they, for example, potash is um, very important for the strengths of the roots for the plant. Potash is important for um, the water resistance of a plant. It is important for the texture, for the fertility of the plant. These are all things you cannot immediately see, but which are very, very important for the quality of the plant. Um, nitrogen, for example, is the, is the part of the fertilizer um, where you see the growth and the greenness of the, of the leaves immediately. So this is something where you see 
the effect of fertilization immediately as a farmer. But if you are well educated as a farmer, you know that the right balance is the only thing that helps. And that means, means um, a higher need for fertilizers in total because of a higher need for um, plants and nutrition just immediately also means a higher need for potash. And that's why the mega trend is really absolutely in, intact. And I mean, we saw the growth of the last years very much from um, countries like Brazil who increased their arable land very much. We saw it also from China who had a, um, less balanced fertilization um, in the earlier years and now improved that very much. India, for example, they still don't have a balanced fertilization. So there is a huge potential um, if India would um, switch to that um, also for the nutrition of the world. Yeah. But demand grows um, and long term demand grows is not a question at all. To give you um, an overview of the structure of the potash market, um, I want to give you a feeling where is supply situated. These are the dark blue um, bars and where is demand coming from. And you basically see that the main potash volumes just geologically are in the northern hemisphere, basically. And here in um, Canada, in Russia, Belarus. Um, and yeah, also then um, the, the third biggest part um, in Germany, uh, the things you see here in Asia, this is um, ICL, so Israeli and Potash is counted to that. And these are smaller um, projects and salt lakes. So this, these are not really um, geological underground um, areas where you will find Potash. So what I want to give you as an impression on that slide is that Potash is a world market because you have geologically the reserves in some areas and you have the demand in other areas. That is why um, there are long transport distances for, for that product, which is totally fine. And this is not the case, for example, for salt, because salt is available almost everywhere. These are very local markets. Um, and that's why it has also different market dynamics. What you also see on this slide is that um, Russia and Belarus, that's why we colored it in red um, since, I mean, first of all, um, Belarus was sanctioned before the war. Belarus has um, a share in the Potash market, um, in a Potash market of around 77 million tons of around um, 12 million tons um, would normally come from Belarus. And Belarus was sanctioned, as I said, not with regards to the war, but with regards to the um, undemocratic behavior during the elections already before. And these are really hard sanctions and they lost their harbor in Lithuania and cannot use it anymore. Um, and that's why all the exports they can do, they can do them via Russia. And we will come to this in a second. Also Russia was especially last year limited with regards to the war. They were not sanctioned one day that means um, they they always could deliver to customers who wanted their, their product theoretically, but there were a lot of moral reasons in the world who didn't want to do business with them. And they had a lot of logistical issues because Russia is very self-sufficient in a lot of um, topics, but not with regards to logistics. And as they, in addition, had to share their capacities, their harbor capacities, their train capacities with Belarus, um, it was yeah a real challenge to get the product out. And that's why last year, um, out of these um, shown tons here, basically, so Russia and Belarus together have seven um, have 28 million tons. And last year, 15 million tons um, were missing in that in that picture. That's why you only see here 17. Um, this is the um, reduced number, basically. This graph also shows you, again, the um, weights on the potash market. You have, for sure, the big um, producers, um, Nutrin and Mosaic in Canada. These are our biggest comp um, competitors in, in Canada. 
and um, Eurocali and BPC, these are, um, and, and Eurochem um, further on the right, these are the companies I'm talking about when I talk about Russian and Belarusian po um, potash. So last year out of 28 million tons, 15 million tons were missing. This year, they were more successful in sharing the harbor capacities in um, getting more harbor capacities um, and, and also shipping capacities from logistical carriers by paying logistical premiums of um, around 150 US dollar, which was quite massive and also took them away from um, offering too low prices in the end. Um, yeah, and this year, 7 million tons were still missing, which is from a 77 million tons market, still 10%. Um, so still a massive number. And the question is how this will develop coming into the next year. For sure, they will come back with their capacities step by step. But for example, IFA said they will probably need until 2026 to do that. And um, that's also what we think because um, still the harbor is not available to Belarus. Um, but for me, it's more, it's it's not really the message of the missing capacity right now. The big um, change the whole situation brought to us was first of all, a great free cash flow and a very healthy balance sheet after the year 2022, after a great year with great potash prices, we come to that. But looking into the future, the much better um, message is that Russia and Belarus, although I mean they make it to bring out one or the other ship, but they are currently not really working on their expansion product uh, projects. And if you know that 90% of the capacity additions that we normally would have seen during the coming years in the Polish markets would have come out of Russia and Belarus, um, then it's very important to understand that these projects are on ice and at least will be postponed. And this is the great news for the potash market, um, that the supply demand balance will be very tight also throughout the next years. Now, let's have a look at pricing and how the prices reacted on all that. And I just wanted to go back a little bit on the year 2021, because 2021 was a year where um, the potash market was in balance. That means that the demand was after a very long time of very low agricultural prices was coming back to a level um, yeah, that it hit the supply line. Yeah, so it was fully used. The potash market was fully used and don't forget, at this time, Belarus was fully there and Russia was fully there. So with good agricultural prices, um, the world used the full supply that was available. So it became clear that now the growth can only be fed by capacity additions. And if you look at who did capacity additions in the last years, in 2008, when we saw nice um, potash prices already shortly, um, 160 projects were started, only three of them were further developed. And one of this is our Bethune mine, the legacy project, which we developed in Canada. And that's just very important to understand the Polish market was fully used before the war, um, the world, uh, the, the war situation. Yeah, then the war, then the Belarus sanctions came on top and Polish prices, um, so when it was fully used, they were rising from around 250 US dollars to 500 US dollars. When Belarusian Polish sanctions came on top, they were rising to around 790 US dollars. Still no war situation. And then the war situation came on top and made clear, wow, there are very big supply constraints in the market and prices rose to over a thousand, which was definitely overdone. That's... Um, no question at all. And, and um, we had wished that it would have gone slower and, and be more sustainable because what we saw afterwards was that farmers were holding back on this high price level because there was a lot of insecurity in the markets with regards to agricultural prices. What will they do? How will they develop? And farmers 
went into a wait and see attitude. Yeah. And this happened in a time of the year where you can afford to wait and see. Yeah. There are always, um, there's always the spring season where you have the spring in the Northern hemisphere where all the demand of all the regions comes together. In the second half of the year, you, the demand is more regional with different seasons and there the possibility um, to wait and hold back is always um, bigger, which then started in the second half of 2022. And then the question was, uh, how fast will Polish prices bottom out? And um, actually it happened fast, but it happened on a much lower level than everyone thought. So the whole industry was thinking that probably the right level would be at least 500 uh, to bottom out because um, Belarus um, and, and Russia are still um, not fully back in the market. But um, there were a lot of things happening and uh, seasons happening and China um, who is the only market who has uh, contracts, long-term or one-year contracts for Podish, who then um, did a, a strange um, Podish contract with the um, Canadian competitors, which all, yeah, all um, brought the price to bottom out at quite a low level. Um, that means at around um, yeah, 320 US dollar. That that was the level we saw. Right now we are already back in, in Brazil. That's always the um, overseas reference markets we are looking at. Um around 350, 360. So those so that's good news. We saw it finally bottoming out, but for sure it was on a lower um level, first of all, than we saw. But for sure, this also increases the prospects because now um the farmer is not questioning if prices will fall further. Um, they are now fully coming back with demand, what we already saw in the European autumn season very nicely, um, so that the um, usage of the potash market should be quite high again, uh, which should also um, be a positive sign um, for pricing in the upcoming months. And that's what we also um, built into our guidance. Um, and I don't want to um, look into the yearly result too much. All I want to show you with that picture is that, yes, we are in a cyclical business. Yeah. But after we sold our operating unit Americas in uh, 2021, we are even more dependent on this agricultural, on this potash cycle. But I, I guess what we learned strategically is that this is not a problem because the only thing you have to take care of is that you manage this cycle very well, yeah? And that's why, and now I'm coming to our strategy and uh, looking more um, into the long-term future, is that we said, optimize the existing business. And that's what you see here in that chart with 70% of management focus is the important factor we have to take care of because we have to make sure that also at the low end of the cycle, we are not burning money. We will make very good money. We made a cash flow of over a billion last year um, in, the, in the upper times of the cycle, but we should not burn money. And that actually happened in 2020 at the low end of the cycle. This should never happen again. And we have a lot of measures on all the different sites. And I will come to a few examples in the next few minutes to show you how much we are working on that. For sure, also uh, growth is a is a, a remains a topic, but with a much um, lower management focus. And here, the balance sheet situation is um, always key. So we will not accept more than one point five times um, net debt to EBITDA, also in the low end of the cycle. And new business areas. This is referring to our big infrastructure that we have um, with. Um, uh, very big tailings piles, which we can um, cover where we will store uh, construction waste. This is a, a nice business model. Um, we use underground caverns to store a lot of things and there are very big um, potentials also with regards to hydrogen. So um, all very interesting areas, but the focus is on optimizing the existing business. And here, just a few examples, the clear focus of our sites, Bethune, the mine in uh, Canada is definitely our implemented growth story because we are now at um, a production usage of um, 2 million tons and we will ramp it up over the upcoming years to 
uh, 4 million tons um, slowly, yes, 100 to 150,000 tons ramp up um, per year, um, but steadily. Still, it's, we will um, still have a lot of optimization um, possibilities and um, increases in the ore grade. Vera 2060, Vera is our biggest German site, and I will come to this in um, on the next slide. And Neuhof, we will also look um, very much to the optimized usage of the ore contents. Vera 2060, this is one very important project which we communicated in November last year. Um, and basically, it is a project where we combine economic advantages with ESG advantages. Um, and it, it would be too complicated to um, explain all the technical components of that. You can have a look um, at the presentation later. But what we definitely will do is that we um, will have a lot of um, NPV advantages also with regards to ESG because we will save on um, the um, residues, salty residues, um, solid and liquid. Um, we will reduce the CO2 emissions and the cost around that and also the energy needs. And um, yeah, this is um, a very promising project which will um, especially increase also the lifetime of, of the project because otherwise we would have come to um, a border when it comes to allowances to um, further do it like we did it in the past. That's why we um, can combine that very nicely. And it's a very economic project. Um, also to give you a short um, view on the climate strategy. Um, first of all, we want to highlight that we already reduced our CO2 emissions from 1990 to 2020 by 80%. That's why until 2030, our goal by reducing of reducing by another 10% doesn't look very ambitious. Um, with where 2060, we will be able to um, increase that reduction number. Yeah, We will communicate that with our annual report. But our long-term goal is that we will be climate, um, that we will be CO2 um, neutral um, in 2050. That's um, worldwide the, um, the goal. But in Germany, we will already be able to do that in 2045 for sure. Um, the electricity, our production processes can be switched to electricity, but for sure it has to be there um, enough at a, um, at a good price and um, also in the regions where we need it. And that's why we prepare a lot with energy suppliers to have, first of all, that access, but also enough renewable energies to um, provide for that. And this just um, as a final slide, um, when it comes to um, ESG, um, for sure, we have our contribution to the 17 um, SDGs. Um, you see the um, fields here, which are highlighted in the, in the um, color climate action, zero hunger, um, good health, um, life on land, sustainable cities, responsible consumption and clean water. These are the SDGs we are um, having a contribution to. Yeah, and maybe just a last word on our capital allocation strategy. Um, we, on the very successful last year, we paid out 40% of our free cash flow. And we did that half, half, half dividends, half share buybacks. And um, we will also communicate our new capital allocation strategy um, soon. And I guess you will be able to um, orientate on, on a certain share of free cash flow, which will be distributed. And um, yeah, probably it would be um, a good way to look at it um, that dividends should not um, fluctuate too much and that you can always um, share with shareholders um, very good years with share buybacks. So that's why you would take the fluctuations off with uh, share buybacks um, to have more stable dividends. And um, yeah, this is how we look at uh, capital allocation in, in that way. Yeah, this is a very um, short <laughs> overview of k And I hope you have a good overview of the company. And now I'm looking forward to four minutes of questions. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. There are already 
a few questions in the chat. Um, so first of all, regarding debt, you decrease the debt and uh, how much debt is there is there still left and what's the strategy on the debt? Yes, we don't have debt anymore. That's um, or at least no no financial debt anymore. We have a net asset position of around 300 um, million euros. Um, net financial asset positions and then for sure we also have our long-term provisions with regards to our mining obligations that means if you're a mining company you always have to take care for the mines forever basically yeah you have to close them down or you have to take care for the tailings piles for quite a long time these are very small cash outs yearly in the future but over a very long time and that's why these mining obligations um, sum up to around a billion, yeah, um, which is then making up the net debt position of around uh, 700 um, million euro um, as of 30th of June. And um, yeah, as this is also counted into the number net debt to EBITDA, we will take care of the fact that we will not have a very high um, financial debt anymore. Yeah, because um, the the past showed that it was burdening on us and on the share as well very much, and um, that's why we we can use some some leverage al already with that um, provisions, but not too much. And uh, with the 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 prices are now bottoming out or increasing slightly, is there a chance that you? Uh, maybe increase or decrease your guidance uh, in the coming years? What's what's the, the goal here and what's the plan? Um, yeah, I mean, for sure, you, you saw that um, that our um, EBITDA is really a big function of the potash price. Yeah, and we, for example, had to decrease our guidance uh, for this year to the shown range, 600 to 800 um, million euro. And um, I mean, this gives you an EBITDA level for the potash price we are currently seeing, which is definitely in in the lower range of of um, things people are expecting. Yeah, and that's because it should um, provide for a higher EBITDA in case potash prices show the tight supply and demand situation. Yeah, and. Uh... Maybe can you elaborate again on the on the share buyback program? Uh, what what is the goal for the coming years? Yes, so we um now have bought back um around a bit more than um sixty percent of the uh, current uh, program. So we decided for the good year twenty twenty two to um do a share buyback program of two hundred million euros. Um, and it's um running very nicely. It's in the hands of the bank, so we don't have an, an influence on that. Uh, so they did just have the goal to buy back two hundred million euros, and it will be decided year by year. So we will always have a look at the last year's free cash flow. Yeah, um, around March when we also decide on the dividend, and then decide on the dividend and the share buyback in a package. Yeah. Okay, so the time is already up. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation and the, all the answers were also very nice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day, yeah?